First of all, I want to acknowledge that Rob is a wonderful director of Fry College. <laughs> I plan to talk for several minutes, maybe more than several, on the newest piece I've done. Not just because it's the newest and I'm still in love with it, but I think it requires a little bit more explication than some of my other work, which may seem uh, easier to grasp uh, on first glance. So uh, this group of five pay, uh, prints hanging together is called Piero Forever. And that is my way of acknowledging that my hero is Piero della Francesca. And I chose to excerpt, or if you wish, crop uh, five of the paintings of his that are still extant, that are favorites of mine. And I'll explain a little bit about each one of them. And then I will explain um, how I went about doing it. So this is the uh, culmination of about 50 years of thinking. It's, that's an obscene waste of time, isn't it? No, it isn't. Um, because he's been, um, I, I've said before, I've had husbands, I've had boyfriends, but he's always, he's always been with me. Ever since I took a Renaissance painting course and the professor, Joe Ablo, uh, artist in Boston now, said, uh, you know, this painting, and he was pointing to the flagellation, we'll get there in a minute. This painting should require no words, and then he went and started tracing with his finger the way the painting pieces, parts fit together. And I thought, holy mackerel, it isn't, it isn't a uh, reproduction of reality, it is, it's its own reality. And that's sort of been a goal of mine, uh, even though my own style and my own subjects have changed over the years, I've still tried to keep Piero's uh, brilliant way of simplifying and reorganizing in mind as I've gone along. Now the five parts that I determined I was going to use are from the Archimedean solids. Piero was a geometer. He was a mathematician before he was a painter. In his era, he was revered as a mathematician, also as one of the inventors of the kind of perspective that we use now. And the Archimedean solids include the rhombic cubo octohedron. <laughs> Believe me, that's not easy for me to say. It's this one up here. The Rami Cubo octahedron is a way of customizing a sphere, I guess you could say. And so I took the five parts of the Rami Cubo octahedron that you could see if you were looking at one straight on, and then I pulled the, uh, quote, edges forward so that I'd get a bigger space. And I decided that that would be a way of unifying the whole, even of the parts were in real life never unified. This, none of these parts were on the same surface ever. Let's start with the easy one in the middle. It was hardly cropped at all. It's the Synagogue of Madonna, which is in um, the Ducal Palace in Urbino, which is in the Marche in Italy. And it was commissioned by Federico de Montefaltro, who was the best patron that Piero had over the course of his lifetime. He also worked for the Pope, but uh, Federico de Montefeltro seemed to be a perfect fit, and he had lots of money. So the little Madonna in the center with the child and the two angels was his own private votive piece. It doesn't take place in a grand cathedral. The setting is very modest. It looks like it could be a bedroom. Um, the window has shafts of sunlight coming through. There's a softness to the choice of setting as well as to the depiction of the figures. And all I did was remove a little of the top and a little of the bottom to get a perfect square. So you're seeing basically what uh, Piero did, except of course I've simplified even the great simplifier. Um, I've shown you what I conceive of it as his original outlines. 
I used linoleum. That I could have used wood, but I used linoleum. And in so doing, it's possible to have those nice wide lines that, that describe the various forms. Um, I also simplified the volumes which Piero uh, was more likely to, to shade. Um, I can shade, but I didn't want to do it where I didn't have to do it. As a matter of fact, the only shaded part I recall here is the angel's wing on the left, but I digress. The, uh, the beauty of this little votive piece, I think, is the uh, uh, Christ child himself who wears a amulet. Does anybody recognize that kind of amulet? You don't see them very much anymore because branch coral is almost gone in this world. But babies used to teethe on branch coral, which would be hung around their necks. And so that's what he has around his neck, is a teething piece, but it also mimics or is a reflector for, for the cross. And it also is a reflector for, for a tree, there by the name Branch Coral. And of course, it uh, alludes to the ultimate crucifixion. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of visual clues in that picture which you don't need to know to enjoy it, but it's sort of fun to know. The two angels, I might just point out, are smaller than the monumental Madonna. And I'll have to tell you that if you've looked in this book, which is, and you can look in it later, the flagellation, I'm sorry, the uh, Synagogia Madonna is on this page. And the, the major change I made was to make the baby a little less, uh, Grumpy looking. <laughs> Figured I had to live with it for months, so. Um, and so in here is a description uh, by Marilyn Arenberg Laban, a great uh, art historian at Princeton. She, she describes the content of, of most of these pictures. Of course, some of these pictures are in um, real doubt because they're mysterious. Um, Piero didn't write anything about his painting. He wrote a lot about perspective. He wrote a lot about geometry. But the content of his painting has been left to us to argue about. And if we move over to the right-hand panel, which is the two gentlemen, one in red and one with a beard, these are two gentlemen out of a wonderful painting called The Flagellation. It's just a small painting, and actually it hangs in the Ducal Palace in Urbino, right next to the Senegalia Madonna. This is probably no more than 12 by 18 inches, maybe less, and uh, yet it encompasses a huge amount of information in a beautifully organized way. And you can see that on the right, the two of the three figures there are two figures that I chose. It's a picture which he used the trick of, of subdividing space, as he did in some of his other work. And here, I've just chosen the two figures that I like the best and find the most um, seductive, if you will. The um, figure on the left is probably a astronomer. Astronomers were considered to be brilliant or wise people. And that divided beard, barbanera, meaning black beard, uh, was a distinguishing feature of uh, smart men with good jobs. Um, and he is gesturing to this figure in red, who is a, definitely a, a mystery. I have decided that he is a odd Antonio de, Mont de Monte Feltro, either an illegitimate son or a nephew of Federico de Monte Feltro, again, the person who paid for the picture, and that he is being depicted as he was in life, but that he actually died, and probably of, of a dread disease in his early 20s. And so that it's sort of a memorial. They're not really talking to each other. Um, it's, it's simply that the figure in red is included in the picture because the patron wanted him to be, and you know, what better reason than that? Um, over on the other side of the picture, as it is in reality, is a, a, a scene that has been 
variously described as the flagellation of Christ or the flagellation of Saint Jerome. And if you want to read about that, you can. Personally, I don't find uh, the argument worth going into for us right now. Down at the bottom is a group of soldiers and above or behind the heads of the soldiers is a foot with a wound in it. And I bet you can understand when I tell you that that's the Christ's foot as he steps out of the tomb the morning after the crucifixion and gosh darn if the only people there are sound asleep and haven't a clue. <laughs> so this painting which Bill and I saw, Bill has, I forgot to introduce you, this is Bill Phillips who is making a film about me. And we've been a lot of places together now and one of the places we've been is uh, Italy and we've gone around to the places I personally have made prints of and also to some of my favorite pictures. And this one we saw in San Sepulcro on the wall of a municipal building and the top of the picture is the risen Christ and as he steps up out of that tomb he becomes the biggest person you have ever seen. I mean in, in the painting he's probably four feet tall but he is he is such a huge presence and he is so commanding so um, in control so the opposite of the kind of images you see of depositions and um, you know where the Christ is crumpled and sort of uh, pitiful. This Christ, uh, Piero's Christ, is not pitiful. On the left are three angels from the um, depiction of the baptism, which is a wonderful painting I've seen. It's in the National Gallery in London. Maybe it's in the British Museum. I'm not absolutely positive. Anybody know? Thank you. The whole thing has this gorgeous uh, composition of the, the dove of um, the Holy Spirit at the top, St. John and the Christ, some people getting baptized back there, and then on the left-hand side, these somewhat mysterious angels, uh, which I've just always loved for themselves, you know, I don't really care. Uh, if they're boys or girls, and they are sort of androgynous, but uh, the case has been made by Marilyn Laban that they are, because of the way they're holding hands, it's definitely the pose of men, and uh, the skirts, of course, are, uh, that's irrelevant. So wh whatever you want to do about a backstory for those figures, I just hope you can can love them for their for their beauty, because I think the uh, bottom line in Piero is a kind of austere beauty that is totally timeless, totally timeless. On the top, the top segment is the story from, uh, it's part of the story of the True Cross, which is a cycle of frescoes, again, Bill and I visited um, in Arezzo, in a beautiful, uh, old church. Actually, it's a pretty ordinary looking old church. It's the inside that's so fabulous. The whole chapel behind the narthex is illustrated on the walls with frescoes by Piero della Francesca. Uh, the story of a true cross, which is a, an odd combination of uh, myth and Christian story. Uh, actually uh, a political effort to get uh, a third crusade going and you know uh, Catholic politics were um, were part of the uh, cycle story uh, because the work was paid for by the Bacci family who were supporters of the Franciscans who owned the church and uh, the Pope was very much anxious to get funding for a third crusade against the Turks. For better or for worse, he died before he was able to get the ships headed in the right direction. But uh, the story then em embodies elements of the East and the West, and this Solomon and Sheba part of the story is where King Solomon 
is receiving the Queen of Sheba who has come to learn from him and to bring him fabulous gifts. One of the things that enchants people about this whole section of the story, but everything on this page, is the doubling of the female figures. Uh, they, they are mirror images of each other, and they are just somehow mesmerizing to us even now. The swan-like necks of these uh, serving ladies, the ladies-in-waiting, their beautiful, dignified postures and costumes are just as much a part of the story as uh, the main characters, Solomon and Sheba. I, I went to the internet yesterday to uh, click on um, Solomon and Sheba, and um, what came up was just so, uh, so mystifying. It was all the movies that have ever been made. Of them. <laughs> and the first one was Sophia Loren, and she was paired as Sheba with Yule Brynner oh, as Solomon. Yes. So, you know, uh, c cultural ideas change, they wax, they wane, and I, I just feel very fortunate that I have a culture hero who I think will be with us forever. Uh, so again, I digress, but uh, you probably will note that I've used the same kind of, of, of line which in Piero has disappeared under paint, but I've kept it there because I want to emphasize the notion that he is a draftsman whose uh, paintings are all, they have a scaffolding of very carefully thought out arrangements of parts. The whole idea of art is to take what is disorganized and order it. And he does it to a fairly well. Maybe because of his background in geometry, maybe because of the kind of mind he had. Um, I, don't, I don't really know. He came from a fairly wealthy family in San Sepulcro, so we know he had an education in Latin and Greek and uh, whatever else were the subjects that a good Renaissance boy would, would study. The big challenge for me in this grouping was to get the colors to be happy with each other because Piero, at the end of his life, when he did the flagellation and the Senegalese of Madonna, he suddenly had access to the brand new technology of oil paint on wood panel. Wow, just like Saberfield getting access to the technology of Giclée printing. You know, I bet he said, oh God, I'm glad I lived long enough to see this. So anyway, uh, the colors in the oil on panel paintings are more jewel-like. And the colors in the pictures like the Solomon Sheba and the uh, lower painting of um, the Resurrection, they are more muted because they've been on walls forever, you know, uh, subject to dampness and smoke and whatever else. Uh, whereas the others that were panel paintings, and that includes the three angels on the left, they had a quality of freshness to them that I have to think was more what Piero had in mind, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to do disservice to the pictures that I took from fresco, so I tried to sort of get them all to play together. So, you know, that's about uh, where I am on that image. Uh, those are all individual linoleum cuts, which I pulled by hand on my big press, and they're soon to be published as a very large single gicle with, instead of frames separating them all and white wall behind them, they will be separated by a nice band of black. And man, does that make them, I just, yes. I came home yesterday and the postman had delivered a big tube yeah. with the first one of those gicle prints in it and I unwrapped it and I thought, whoa. So, um, just let anybody who wants to chat with me, chat with me and uh, go over and talk with Daryl where her work is hanging and many thanks for taking a beautiful day and coming inside.